be turning to the Old Testament book of Genesis. We'll get there eventually, but before we do, I want to share something with you that originally came from a transcript of a marriage seminar that I found online a while back. And I thought about it recently as Sandy and I have been quarantined in our house for the past couple of weeks. And I know that some of you have perhaps during this pandemic found yourself spending more time than usual at home with your spouse or with your family. Now, for Sandy and me, it was just fine. We love each other and we like each other at least most of the time. But for some folks, maybe all that time together might just be a bit too much. Well, anyway, looking at the marriage seminar, one thing that caught my attention was a story about Martin Luther and how he came to be married and what he learned about marriage. You may know a lot of this. Martin Luther was a monk and a priest who lived way back in from, from 1483 to 1546. He was the man who rebelled against the Catholic Church and helped to begin what is known in history as the Protestant Reformation Movement. So I'm going to share with you today my edited version of the story I found. And the story is somewhat lengthy, but I think you'll find it interesting and perhaps a bit entertaining and probably even humorous at times. But I share it because it ultimately speaks of one very important ingredient in a good and happy marriage. And I hope you would work to develop that ingredient in yours. And, and by the way, this same ingredient, this same quality will work well and is helpful in any relationship, your relationship with other family members, with others in our church family, your relationship with coworkers and other folks. So even if you're not married, I hope and think you'll still find something helpful in today's lesson. So here's the story. It was Easter morning and there were these 12 nuns and you would have thought they would have been busy preparing for Easter services. Instead, they were climbing into 12 fish barrels trying to get smuggled out of their convent. And the entire scheme was devised by Martin Luther. Well, looking back to his early life, the story is told that one day he was walking along and was nearly struck by lightning. And he took it as a revelation from God that God must have been displeased with him. And so he then committed his life to going into ministry as a monk. He took a vow of celibacy and poverty. He was a brilliant legal mind, but it is said that he drove himself almost mad studying the Bible over and over and over, looking at all of God's commands and decrees and realizing how woefully short he in fact fell. And this led to severe depression. He would spend hours upon hours in the confessional with another priest. He would actually harm his own body, trying to do penance and to pay God back to atone for his sins by his own suffering. And then Martin Luther had the most amazing moment. He was studying the Bible and he went to places like Habakkuk. And then he found Habakkuk quoted in Romans and also in Galatians, where it says that the righteous shall live by faith. And it finally dawned on him. I'm not saved by my works and what I do. I'm saved by Jesus. 
and, and what he did and faith in his works and his sinless life, faith in his death on my behalf and his resurrection. And that was, in some regards, the real beginning of what we now call the Protestant Reformation. And he took his convictions, all those things he now believed the Bible taught in contrast to what the church taught. And he took this list and nailed it to a door in a place called Wittenberg. I, I guess the equivalent today would be perhaps like going on Facebook and posting it there for all the world to see. Well, this was back in the 1500s. This was a time where you, you had Gutenberg in the printing press, Copernicus and Galileo. It was a time of massive global change in many different ways. And then Martin Luther started what would ultimately lead to a massive alteration in how Christians were viewing the issue of salvation and what the Bible taught about what one had to do to be saved. And one of the things that he concluded in the midst of all these other issues was that marriage is a good thing and children are a blessing. This was, of course, in stark contrast to the basic teaching of the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church taught that the best life of all was the life of a monk or a nun to be celibate and to give oneself to poverty and to live in simplicity. They taught that marriage and children were for those who had a lower degree of spirituality, for those who couldn't withhold their passions as compared to what they considered to be the best and holiest people, those who chose to remain virgins and live in poverty, devoted only and completely to God. <clears throat> but after reading and studying the Bible, Martin Luther came to realize that what was being taught about marriage was not true. And then he decided, I'm going to quit being a monk. I'm going to go enjoy my life. And so he wrote a little tract called On Monastic Vows. And in it, he renounced his own vows. And then he encouraged other monks and nuns to renounce their vows and for priests to leave the priesthood and for nuns to leave the convent. Well, this tract found its way into one particular convent where there were a dozen nuns, most of them young, and they discovered this tract from Martin Luther and they started reading. They read, it's a good thing to get married. It's a good thing to make babies. And they decided, it's a good thing for us. So they wrote a letter to Martin Luther, basically asking him to help them break out of the convent. So he devised a scheme whereby a man who was supposed to be delivering food to the nuns on Easter brought with him 12 empty barrels and smuggled those 12 women out of the convent. And it worked. Many of them went back to their families. Apparently all the women were pretty quick to get married, with one exception. There was one woman who didn't get married. She couldn't get married because no one wanted to marry her. Her name was Katerina von Bora. At one point, she was actually engaged to a man to whom 
Martin Luther had introduced her, kind of a blind date set up, I guess. But at the last minute, he backed out of marrying her. And the reasons we find historically are many. The two primary reasons being that she was unattractive and unpleasant. Martin Luther, apparently in connection with her being dumped at the altar, so to speak, said she was stubborn and filled with pride, and he wasn't surprised that the guy backed out. So in response, Katerina boldly approached Martin Luther and told him, my mom died when I was about six. I went into the convent when I was about nine or 10. I became a nun when I was 16. Now as an adult woman, I have read your teaching. I've renounced my life as a nun. I have fled from the convent and you owe me a husband. And if you don't find me a husband, since you're single, you're going to be my husband. <laughs> Martin Luther said, no one will ever thrust a wife on me. He was 40 years old and he did not want to get married. He may have learned that marriage is a good thing, but he didn't want to get married. And he certainly did not want to marry Katerina von Bora. He was not attracted to her. He was not interested in her, but she would not give up. I mean, she nagged him over and over. You have to marry me. You have to marry me. So finally, on June 13th, the year 1525, apparently hoping it would finally get her to leave him alone, he asked her, all right, will you marry me? Well, she said yes. And somehow they were married that same day. His friends wept bitterly. <laughs> when, they, when they came to him and asked, why did you marry her? He said, and this is a quote, to spite the devil, which is probably the least romantic reason ever given in the history of the world why a man would marry a woman. It might have been true on his part, but I doubt any woman wants to hear that. But they got married. And then she got pregnant. And this was quite a scandal because there was a bit of an old wives tale and folklore in Germany back then that the Antichrist would come from the union between a rebellious nun and a renegade monk. So there were many who thought this is going to be the end of the world. But it wasn't. She gave birth and the world didn't end. In fact, they ended up having six children, three boys and three girls, which is ironic and surprising considering how unappealing she was supposed to be to him. It is said that Martin and Katerina were very socially awkward to each other. Neither one had spent much time around members of the opposite sex, so they didn't really know how to do it. Stories were told that she would be sitting there with him. There they are, a married couple, and she had no idea how to talk to a man, so she'd just say stuff like, so who's the king of Prussia? And he's thinking, what's going on with this weird woman I'm married to? Is she addicted to Jeopardy or what? Also, when she moved into his home, it was, as you might expect, a complete bachelor pad. It was an old monastery and guys were coming and going all the time. She'd have to fix dinner for like a hundred people almost every night because the Reformation movement was sort of exploding right there out of their home. All kinds of things going on. And he really was a bachelor and a nasty one at that. He slept in straw, which 
they did that back then, but I imagine they usually changed it on a regular basis. Well, Martin Luther had apparently not changed his for many years. And so she cleaned up his house. She threw out a bunch of stuff, probably burned most of it. And she actually turned it into a lovely home. She planted a garden. She tried to help him eat better. Wives do that sometimes, it seems. And guess what happened over time? Martin and Katerina became friends. They actually developed an amazing friendship. You don't learn that from reading the theology of Martin Luther, but when you read their letters to each other, and I think there were many that have been found, at least a few dozen that still exist, but the tone of those letters over the years gets really sweet and affectionate. She became a great confidant, an ally. As he was writing letters and books, oftentimes she was literally just sitting at his side as his friend. And so she's actually included in some of his correspondence to other people, you know, like Katerina's here, she says hi. And he had a lot of nicknames for her. Now, some of you probably have nicknames that you don't want anybody else to know about. I understand that. But he would refer to her as Lord Katie. I'm sure he meant that in a very affectionate way. The Empress, Your Grace. Wise woman. Gracious lady. Holy lady. Dear wife, my true love, my sweetheart, and my gift from God. Katerina had a strong sense of humor and irony and sarcasm, which was probably quite necessary for her to be able to stand alongside a, a big personality like Martin Luther. And once in a while, he would start to pick at her a little bit. You know, husbands and wives do that sometimes. And she would act many times just like a good preacher's wife. She'd say things like, <clears throat> you obviously didn't pray enough before that last sermon that you gave. There were times when he would become very melancholy and depressed. You might not know this, but preachers can be like everybody else sometimes. But Katerina learned how to help snap him out of it. One occasion, the story is told, he returned home to find her dressed all in black like a widow in mourning. He looked at her and said, who died? And she said, well, if the great Martin Luther is this depressed, I just assumed that God had died. Well, apparently that worked to get him out of his depressed mood. But here's the point. Something dramatic and unexpected happened to Martin Luther. What started out as, we're certainly not friends. We just, we don't like each other at all. I'm not really interested in her, but I kind of need to marry her because I did jailbreak her out of a convent. All that actually turned into a most glorious marriage. As the years went by, his thinking and teaching about marriage continued to evolve. In fact, later on in his life, he said this, there is no more lovely, friendly, and charming relationship, communion, or company than a good marriage. And that's quite a change from where this story began. Now, I know that story was rather long, but I think it's not only interesting, but also it's a valuable lesson showing us today how good a marriage can become regardless of whatever issues there might have been at one time. 
In other words, don't give up. It really can get better. And there are surely a lot of key ingredients in a good marriage. But one of those most important ingredients is friendship. There's a sociologist and researcher named John Gottman. He studies marriage and he says that men and women are very different. I'll bet you knew that already. But he says, there's one thing that they hold in common. To the vast majority of people, the most important thing to both men and women is that their spouse be their nearest and dearest friend. I think God knew that from the very beginning. Which brings us to this one passage in the Bible I want for us to read today. In Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, starting in verse 18. Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Now this is after all the days of creation, specifically after God created Adam and says, I need to find somebody for him. And it says, And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. And the man gave names to all the cattle and to the birds of the sky and every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. By the way, <clears throat> I don't think God expected Adam to find one of these animals, one of these animals to be a good helper for him. I think God wanted him to recognize that there was not any animal that could come close to being what Adam really needed. Look further here, verse 21 and following. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. And the Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. And the man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And verse 24 says, For this cause a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall cleave to his wife and they shall become one flesh. You might say, that God knew Adam would need a friend. And that's a big part of what God intends for marriage to be. There is a verse in the book of Song of Solomon that fits very well with what we've been talking about. In fact, I've included it in a couple of wedding ceremonies that I've done. In the midst of all that mushy love and romance stuff in Song of Solomon, there is one little phrase that one spouse says about the other. This is my beloved and this is my friend. I think you would agree. That is a very good and beautiful description of what God intends for marriage. This is my beloved and this is my friend. And so I encourage you in your marriage, develop that friendship between you and your spouse. Cherish each other in the joy of love and romance, 
but also cultivate and appreciate the relationship you have as friends. Treat each other as best friends so that you will indeed be best friends. If you will do that, it will surely be a great blessing to you both. Let me close with this. There is another friend that we all need. A friend who loves us dearly and who blesses us abundantly and with life eternal. Jesus one time said, you are my friends if you do what I commanded you. Are you walking with the Lord, living according to his will? Do you have that wonderful relationship with the Lord that he so very much desires? Or have you instead, as the Bible warns about, become friends with the world? I urge you to walk closer to the Lord and make living for him and with him the most important thing in your life. And by the way, one of the great bonuses we find in life is this. When we have a truly close and wonderful relationship with the Lord, all the rest of our other relationships are going to benefit as well. Walk with the Lord and your life will be greatly blessed.